to get us started off, I mean, you touched on this a little bit. There's a few things I'd like to ask, but before anything else, you've mentioned structural shifts and uh, spending capability. And uh, when you put all these factors together, what do you think the timeline is for a recovery? Just because, as you say, there's, there's all these ripple effects coming out. Like it's going to take time for people to get back to work, get back to their regular salaries. It's going to take time for them to get back to spending on what they want instead of what they need. So what kind of time frame do you think we might be looking at? Right. That's, that's a really good question. Put it this way. When you see that almost 50% or 64% have had their salaries reduced to one level or another and 10% having low income, okay? <clears throat> when I think about, you know, how long does it usually take to get a job? Well, typically what, two to three months, okay? And then typically after those two to three months, you start saving, right? Save your last day, which is probably another three, four months, right? So from an unemployed perspective, I would say not till at least the middle of the year. In terms of those who have been less impacted, um, until they feel confident and comfortable to start spending discretionately, right? So in other words, spending on what they want. Um, again, I don't see that happening until probably sometime in the middle to the end of quarter one, all right? So when do I see a genuine recovery coming on board? Uh, I think probably the middle of next year, uh, with the caveat that hospitality needs to open and that we do not have another outbreak. Because one of the worries I have is, you know, the rest of the country follows what Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City does, right? So Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City are starting to open up, but we're also about 70% vaccinated. You have all these migrant workers now going back to the countryside where nobody's vaccinated. So there's a real fear of a potential outbreak in these rural areas and then them coming back into the urban area. So that's, that's the other worry. That's the other worry. Well, that actually factors into another question I wanted to ask you, and that is how different do you think the timelines are going to be for cities like Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi versus secondary cities versus the rest of the country? Right. Um, you know, to be fair, Hanoi has been much less impacted. Okay. But also remember that Hanoi, if I recall the numbers, it's like 40% work for the state. Right. And then you have a lot of people working for NGOs and whatever else. Right. Which uh, in a way are a little bit more, uh, how do you say, uh, 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 emergency proof, yeah. Um, on the other hand, let's be honest, Saigonese are the biggest entrepreneurs in the world, right? So I think uh, Saigon will pick up the pieces quicker, all right? And it's also a bigger market. But again, I think a large part of that will come down to um, basically the, the full economy opening back up. And I think, you know, even still today, we have three, 4,000 cases a day. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So an end potentially in sight, but as you say, a rocky road ahead. Um, we have a question in the chat about how about the share of customers' wallets? Customers' wallet after COVID. Okay. Um, all right. So 68% we're making less money, all right? At varying degrees, okay? So <clears throat> when you think the, the poor, like the, the 10 million dollars below 50% are really struggling, okay? So let me put it to you this way, Havu. If you're selling products that are for the mass market, low income, all right? Your sales are gonna be negatively impacted simply because uh, your consumer base has been the hardest that's been hit. If you happen to be a luxury brand, okay, I don't know, Gucci, Mercedes, or whatever else, even the wealthy, 70% of them have been impacted somewhat. So 
if you want to talk about share a wallet, 30% less than we had before COVID, because that's what the spend shows. That's what the spend shows. Thanks, Ralph. And we have another question from Josephine. Uh, with so many people moving out to their hometowns, will salary be increased due to labor shortage in manufacturing? And if yes, will this also affect other sectors due to adjustment of salary? Uh, that, that's a really good question. Uh, now, I'm not an HR specialist by any means, all right? But it's, it's how do I say it? It's a catch-22. Most of the people that are going back to their hometowns are going back because they didn't have a job. And therefore they can, you know, like uh, the Vietnamese three generational family, they all chip in and survive, all right? Um, so there's that. On the other hand, these people need money because everybody's lost money. So um, look, I, I think for more skilled, like, you know, if you're talking about uh, factory managers or whatever else, uh, I think, yeah, uh, certain salaries will go up uh, in that level. But my feeling is that for the lower income, people who are unemployed, are willing to work for less than they have before to be able to pay the bills. All right, so it's a bit of a uh, catch-22. I'm not really quite sure how to answer that, to be perfectly honest, because there's multiple factors. Okay, I have another question for you, Ralph. Um, you've talked around a lot of these different things. The structural shifts is something that I think deserve a lot more thought and discussion, but what, what I'd like to know is uh, what do you think people should be looking for when it comes to these structural shifts? As in, where are the opportunities in the future? Where are the potential pitfalls uh, as we move ahead and hopefully move towards recovery? I, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record like everybody else does, but I mean, digitalization, uh, online, online, uh, uh, online retailing uh, are some of the genuine structural shifts. Um, more in-home food consumption, more domestic travel, less international travel are some of the structural shifts. I think the biggest one though is going to be uh, consumers moving from traditional trade to modern trade. Uh, that is a huge, huge structural shift because we're talking again about 80% of all spend before COVID being on traditional trade. And during the COVID, now it's about 50-50. So, it, you know, I think those are some of the key ones. And I think also, and, you know, tourism. Um, yeah, maybe uh, what happens is they have tourist areas with testing and blah, 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 blah. So, like, how you how you tourists? Like, you know, maybe it's not like you're just going to ride your bike throughout Vietnam. No. You can only go to certain designated areas. So maybe Spotify tourism might be something of the future. So these are some of the things that I think genuine, genuine structural. Okay, thanks for that, Ralph. Uh, we've got a few more questions. Um, this first one I think is pretty interesting. What do the consumer trends suggest for the holiday period upcoming like Christmas and the Lunar New Year? Oh, good question. Um, yeah. I was just telling everybody how I've, I've got property in Boile and how I'm dying to get there and go on the beach. Well, we don't know if we're going to be allowed to. Right? So, in terms of spend, now, remember, Christmas for the Vietnamese is like Halloween. It's a couple of fun days, except for the 18% who are Christian, all right? So Christmas is never a big spend. Chris is more, Chris is more of a social thing, all right? Tet, which is a big one, all right? So yesterday I had the head of AMB InBev in my office going, Ralph, what's, what's the forecast for how much beer I'm gonna sell at Tet, all right? Well, put it this way, you know, anytime you go through sheer hell, which is, this has been for everybody, especially our kids, right? When you go through a sheer hell, eventually you do have to loosen up your hair and celebrate. So now he's in the beer business, you know, 
$400,000 for a case of beer isn't the end of the world, all right? But maybe a $2 million bottle of whiskey is. So I think the celebrations uh, will be a bit more muted. Uh, the spend will be less, but I don't think it's going to be catastrophic at all either. Because now I think people are looking four months ahead to trying to have a celebration. Okay, thanks for that, Ralph. Uh, our next question is, what do you think the possibility of another wave of COVID is making a comeback? And is, if that does happen, how can we prepare ahead of time? So I think you probably can speak to the protecting your business in that, but uh, what do you think? I, I, I think I, I wanna, the, the first question I'll, I'll, I'll give to Dr. Fauci. Okay, yeah. Because I'm not an expert <laughs> by any means. What can we do? Uh, I think the one thing is securing your supply chain, i.e. you can imagine the number of, say, uh, furniture companies that couldn't get the doohickeys or the hinges or whatever else. So it's for those who can afford it, it's to stock up on some of the basic uh, raw materials and materials that you require to continue production. The other one I think is what you've seen in the EPZ. So uh, I have a brother-in-law who had to live at his factory for three months, all right? So to have some sort of preparedness of how to do that in a more comfortable environment. Because obviously someone asked about like, you know, these workers, how are they gonna come back? They're gonna require some assurances, i.e. what is the COVID protocol if this happens again? So in a way, it's having a plan in place that we've learned the second time around and having the resources to put it into play. Okay, great. Um, and I think we probably have time for a couple more quick questions. I'm aware you have to leave pretty soon. Um, who will benefit from channels shifting? Will MNCs and regional brands expand their share with this? Uh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, you know, remember, in a way, Vietnam got off easy. Okay, yes, we had 800,000 cases. Yes, we've had a lot of deaths. But we've been physically closed down for four months. Canada was physically closed down for a year, basically. Yeah. So the point is, a lot of these big MNCs, especially ones who are very big in the US, North America, Europe, they've suffered globally. And, you know, historically, Vietnam is not such a big part of their business, okay? So, you know, I, I, I think it, this is a perfect opportunity for smaller, more nimble organizations, Vietnamese organizations and foreign organizations alike to take market share away, yeah? I, you know, our, our single biggest competitor here, I mean, basically they, 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 they don't, uh, they're not operational anymore in one of their key sectors because they just, it, it, it uh, financially wasn't, uh, didn't work for them. Yeah. So I think the, the opportunity actually exists for the smaller, more nimble tech savvy companies to come in and take share away. Okay, great. Um, and then I have one final question for you. And that is after everything that's been said so far, after your report and after the Q&A, if there is one takeaway, one thought that you want to linger with people, that you want them to be thinking about a week from now, a month from now, what would that thought be? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, I'm in market research, right? And we do a lot of tracking where we follow consumers over the year, all right? And one of the problems that we've had breaking into new clients is clients say, oh no, I don't want my data norms to be broken. You know, I, I need to compare like for like. You can throw that all out the window. You cannot compare your consumer in January, 2020, 
to your consumer today. They're a completely different animal. So I think the one lingering thought would be, and this is a bit of self-promotion here, <laughs> is this is a perfect time to switch suppliers, vendors, to more limbo, uh, more modern, more uh, in line with uh, the entire digital universe. Now is the time to do that. And the thing is, you know, if you're, hey, you know, these were my customers before these, it doesn't matter. It's a brand new ball game. It's a brand new ball game. It's like, it's almost like we hit a restart button in a way. Yeah. Because, you know, we had a, a series of focus groups the other day for an insurance company. And, and people are just thinking totally differently. And I'll give you one example. <clears throat> a wealthy woman said, you know, spent the last 10 years just trying to make money, make money, make money, make money. Holy crap. I completely forgot how important my health is. Because if I'm not healthy, I can't spend my money. So there's a rejigging of consumer priorities. And your business has to be in line with that. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. So my one lingering thought is don't think what you thought worked before yesterday is going to work the same way it will tomorrow. It's changed. A whole new world. Okay, thanks so much, Ralph, for all of your insights. Uh, as always, it was not only uh, interesting and insightful, it was also entertaining. So thanks, Ralph. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about the chamber, please do reach out to me or look us up online. If you'd like to know more about Ralph or InFocus, please look him up online or on LinkedIn. And uh, we'll hope to see you at Ralph's Q4 report and also at one of our next events. So everyone have a lovely day, stay safe, and we'll hope to see you sometime soon in person. Take care.